Todd O'Donovan to this um, Google Hangout where um, we are continuing the series of what we call leadership takeaways. So thank you very much, Gerard, for being a part of, of, of my series and doing this interview with me and for spending the time. Oh, it's my pleasure, Rachel. Lovely. And I know you've been doing a lot of traveling lately as well, so hopefully we'll be able to get into all of your movements and your developments with Noble Manhattan Coaching, which is the company that you founded and uh, you are running very successfully today. How many years ago was it now, Gerard, that you well, found it? Well, I got into coaching myself in 1996. Um, and as a, uh, a solo entrepreneur, as an individual self-employed person, and I started training coaches in 99. And then I incorporated the company um, into a limited company the following year in 2000. Mm, exactly. So you were really coming at it when coaching was just starting to get big. So it's around about the 90s that it was taking off in America as this idea of counseling or maybe the kind of the black couch uh, that we'd heard about, uh, you know, you go and talk your problems through. But it really started to establish itself in the business world, which is when you, you took it up in the UK. Yes, I came across it by accident in 1995. I was... Uh, I had a, a personal development business called Noble Manhattan Personal Development, and we had a stand at a place in London called Olympia. Um, and I came across a lady, an American lady, who was giving a talk there called Laura Berman Fortgang. And um, I listened to her, and I thought, wow, um, I need to investigate this. So that was my first introduction to coaching in 1995. Wow, yes, yes. So as I say, you, you've been right there since, and, and now it's, it's really building up momentum. What do you think out of interest is the, the one main thing behind the last couple of years where coaching really has gained momentum and traction in, in the business world and in the larger personal development world? Well, it, of course, it started in, it started in two completely different areas, almost simultaneously, but not touching. There was business coaching under people like John Whitmore, a great guy, um, and he'd been doing it since the 80s, but not calling it life coaching at all. And then there was Thomas Leonard who um, came up with the, the phrase life coaching, and that started with individuals. And it was only a few years later that the two came together and merged as um, a cohesive industry. And mm. I, I, I think one of the reasons for its growth is very simple. It's non-intrusive mm -hmm. and it very simply helps people, all people, no matter who they are, to reach their potential, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And because it's gentle, non-intrusive, uh, pure coaching, if we use that term, is non-directional and non-judgmental, um, then it's very attractive to people and it helps individuals to, uh, we use the word empower, to, to, to reach deep down inside themselves and to access the power that they have, even though they may not know that they have it. Mm -hmm. So because of that, because it's gentle, not obtrusive, because it's personal oriented, it, it has just, there has been a groundswell over the last, few years and it's almost reaching um if i use the word tidal wave that's probably a, a bit of an exaggeration but it's reaching a, a tipping point where it is it is and has been now widely accepted worldwide some of the largest corporations in the world are now embracing coaching and even eric schmidt the ceo of google which many would argue is one of the most successful companies on the planet. Even Eric yeah. now is an advocate of coaching and says every manager in the world should have a coach. So that has all happened in the last five years. Yeah, and, and probably a lot to do with the internet, really, oh, with, so. yeah. with the awareness. And, uh, and obviously now we, we are, uh, almost at the hands of the internet in the sense that individual people now have the power and that if something wants to trend very quickly within 
an hour, two hours, you, you can um, trend a view, a point of view from one side of the world to another and it, it, it takes on a life of its own. So that really, they I would say. That, and that, that's certainly um, been one of the drivers. But of course, the internet also has so much inane information and trivial information that there is, yeah. and pe people today are, are getting overwhelmed with information. So on the one hand, mm -hmm. that has been one of the drivers. But on the other hand, there is a danger that people can just get swamped with information that is not empowering mm. to them. Mm. Uh, absolutely. And actually, the internet just reflects what kind of what's going on in your own life anyway. And, and us as coaches know that people get overwhelmed every single day with lack of time or, um, you know, general overwhelm or too much work or no no balance in their personal and their business life so i guess the internet is just enhancing what's already there in people's lives and in the perceived lack of control it is where we come in as coaches so yeah brilliant thank you gerald so what i would now say is moving on to the first component part of what we look at in leadership takeaways is um i, I speak to the ceo who i'm interviewing and i ask them about strategy so very much for you, when you started out, did you go, right, I'm going to come up with a coaching training business that's going to become one of the most successful coaching training businesses in the UK, and you're now spanning out in many countries in Europe as well. Where was your strategy when you when you started? What, what, what was the impetus behind it all? Well, it actually started by accident. It had not been my game plan at that point to do what we have now done. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we actually, we're, we're not European. We, we now have an office in Singapore, one in Panama, one in Richmond, Virginia, one in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. uh, one in Canberra, Australia. So we're in 29 countries now. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but no, that, that, that had not been my game plan. I just wanted, first of all, to be a coach. And mm -hmm. then... I got a little bit frustrated at the lack of what I felt was comprehensive, good quality coach training. So we we tentatively got into that, that market. And it was only then that I began to have more of a, a clearer vision, a crystal vision of what we could achieve. But it didn't start like that. And it was then that we slowly started to expand the business from 2000 and maybe three or four onwards. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it started with, with your passion for sure. coaching? Absolutely, yes. I, I didn't have a business plan. I had nothing on paper. I didn't sit down and work out a military strategy in those early days. It was just following what I really wanted to do and, and loved to do. Yeah, and, and that's generally some of the best companies that have started have started with that have either started with one person or a couple of people going right we know that we work really well together and now what do we do or they've either got a great product or a great passion but then you then come up with <laughs> the strategy once you know you've, you've got something that's successful and that can sell and that can make you some money so when did you feel that you got that traction and that ah Okay, I probably need a bit of strategy now. Well, I can't reach back and, and pinpoint a particular morning or day, but it was around 2004 that I thought to myself, we really need to grow this into a, a proper unified business system that we can use to train really good quality coaches to make a difference in the world. So we started to do that from our UK office in the UK in 2004 putting together more comprehensive courses getting accredited by some of the international institutes and uh, universities um, and then we changed the model in 2008 mm. and we went to um, a distributor or franchise model in order to help us get uh, bigger reach around the world mm, mm, mm. yeah absolutely so what for you is the most 
important component part of your making sure in your strategy that that is clearly precise for you that you you're, you're sure of that part of the strategy well it, it's difficult maybe to, to pick one but I, I think as you build an organization one of the key there are two well there's a couple of key points but one of the the most important is getting buy-in from all of the people within your teams so that you are all following the same vision the same mission and you're all going down the same path together um, so it, it's important to create um i guess i'd use the word team uh, and there's now 350 of us in noble manhattan worldwide um, and communication constant constant communication with your people your teams helping them to understand your ideas, your vision, your beliefs, why you are doing this, the benefits to your clients, your customers, your students. Um, and I, without getting too kooky, helping people to understand what the higher purpose is. Yeah, it's, very, it's very important that you have, in, in my opinion, your sort of basic material purpose, but a, a higher purpose as well. I asked that question, Jara, because I wasn't really trying to catch you out. It was just that um, when I first came across you, I was recommended Noble Manhattan by a, a, another coaching colleague. And I said to her, how did she get her qualifications? And she said, speak to Gerald O'Donovan. She gave me your number. I said, yeah, this is the managing director. She said, yeah, go straight to him and he will take your call. And that's the impression that I got of the company was that um, you were available to take the call, which was wonderful, and I could speak directly to you on the phone. But the one, the one thing that came across to me that was very clear is um, your authenticity and your integrity. And um, obviously, you being the managing director, you you set out, um, you 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 provide that blueprint for your company. So I just wondered if it was a purposeful thing for you that it's like this. You know, because like they say, a thought always happens twice. You know, a chair always occurred as a, th a thought first. And you have these thoughts, Gerard, and then it becomes your company. So that was really the behind my question is your clear thoughts on this is who I am and this is what I want my company and my team to be. And then that impacts the customer's sure. experience. Very much. And we, we, we often jokingly say within the group, you know, being in, in Noble Manhattan is a bit like being a part of the Mafia. Um, you, you're part of the family. There, there's no getting away. Mm. We, we mean that in a nice way, not in a, in, yeah. In a horrible way. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's how I, I felt when I, I, I did the training with you um, uh, and that when I did the um, residential, that everyone is treated equally and um, with a high level of customer service and that everyone's important, the team are as important. And this is becoming a big thing in corporates right now where you've got the internal customer and the external customer and just you know, following on from Richard Branson's thoughts of you, know, you take care of your, your employees and they'll take care of your customers. So it really is helping people to see that it's a big responsibility and it's not just about um, you know, sort of slaving over your employees and making rules and, and get, getting the whip out because very quickly the company will fall apart. You can only rule with authority probably 20 to 50 years ago, and, and that's now it's seen its time. So I think that's where coaching is now emerging, which is great that you've brought that out in your strategy. Um, so I think if there's moving probably from strategy where the next section I look at is very much what are a person or as what's a CEO and what's their company, what do they see as the main strengths that, that have got them to where they are today? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think what my strengths are. <laughs> it's so funny, isn't it? We, we really are not the best advocates. Um, and I, I was coaching somebody the other day, and they were like, oh, and they were also a, a fellow coach, and they were like, oh gosh, why hadn't I thought of that? Um, but we can never see it when it's in front of our face. And then I was doing something the other day, and I got some coaching back from somebody else. And 
I was about to kind of get annoyed with myself, but I thought, hang on a minute, we can never see everything. But that is why we always do need a mentor, another coach to see those things we can't see, which I think is probably why we can't see our strengths and we mm. see our weaknesses is we all automatically, the brain automatically looks for um, threats mm. to keep us safe. So we'll never be looking for the positive because the brain... Yeah. I, I, I can definitely think of a number of weaknesses. Um, <laughs> most definitely. Um, I, know what I'm, I know what I'm not good at. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really a detailed person. Mm. Um, sitting, doing detailed spreadsheets, cash flow forecasts, uh, which which I find I have to do increasingly these days, mm. really uh, disempowers me hugely. Mm. I, I I put off doing those things, put them off and put them off at the slightest little excuse um, until they pile up, and that's a real weakness. Yes. But, but what I'm, I think what I'm quite good at is creating a big picture in my mind yeah. of what the end game, the end result will be. I, I'm able to picture with crystal clarity what I'm trying to achieve, um, even though when I look around me, the reality is far removed from that. There is nothing, no resemblance to that. Yeah. But I, I have a clear uh, aim of what I'm, where I'm aiming for, what I'm trying to get to. The, 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 the other thing I think I'm good at, or at least other people have said I'm good at, is persistence and self-discipline. I'm not the best at anything, uh, by far. There are better managers, better leaders, better coaches, better marketing people, better IT people, better everything really. Than me but what I do do is I never stop mm. so I won't give up on on anything um, once I've decided it's what I want mm. that's mm. very important for us to make really I sit down and work out in my mind do I want this don't I want it why do I want it and then having made a decision then as far as I'm concerned there is no plan B mm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I never give up yeah no, and, and that's um something i'm picking up on on a lot of reading i'm doing at the moment from um some other entrepreneurs and, and coaches in the industry is that uh i think too many times we do give up on things far too soon and um it's not a natural human ability it seems in the general population just to keep going and keep going and keep getting rejected and, and keep falling down and uh, it, it, we almost get to a point i think it's possibly the hollywood movie type thing that we see where we just expect it all to just fall into our hands and no, I think that's it's, part not of like, it's not like that at all and um, one of the challenges of course is when you have people relying on you and most of us do. We have family, partners, wives, husbands, partners. We have children. Um, we have commitments, all of us, of some type. And in the early days when you're building a business, it's very tough. And I know this from, from my past, and I have lots of friends who are entrepreneurs. And everyone goes through a, a phase which might last for a long time, where there is no money. There are no resources. There's no backup. You don't know how you're going to make ends meet. And then you have the difficult conversations at home where things like, when are you going to get a proper job? Um, and so on. And of course, that makes it very difficult to keep your blinkers on and keep focused on what you truly want. It makes it very difficult. Yeah. So in that circumstance, what did you what did you do, Gerard, when it was like, gosh, am I? And like you said, that was one of your strengths. You just kept going because you just knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I do a lot. Um, it's always been part of my daily routine. I have thinking time. I build it into my diary. Um, every single day, I go away for one hour, and I sit. I live near the sea, 
So I go to a little coffee shop overlooking the sea and I have a cappuccino. And I, I take a pad and a pen and nothing else. And I just watch the world and think. Yeah. That's all. I just think yeah. if I've got a goal or an outcome or a desire, I'm trying to achieve. I think about it. If I have a problem or challenge, be it at work or at home, I go yeah. and I think. Yeah. And I find that having what I call quiet thinking time, no phone, I don't take my mobile, I'm mm. not contactable for that hour. Um, I, I find that having that quiet thinking time mm. is invaluable, absolutely invaluable. Ideas come, solutions, thoughts, suggestions, uh, ways forward. Um, they come in the quiet moments, never in my in my experience, in the busy, hectic moments. Yeah, and and those it would have been those moments then that you're suggesting that in that time of doubt or am I going the right way and just following, you know, keep going for that vision, that's when you would do the reflection and, yes, yeah. I, it's, I, it's clear to me I am going the right way. Yeah. And that's an amazing strength, Gerald, which I probably has served you and allowed you to, to enable you to, to get where you where you've got like I said where a lot of uh, people I come across and thought to work that haven't had that and they've given up on something and gone back to a normal job um, and yeah I mean it, 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 it literally is a, a key tool that, that we do need for, for success and that one that you read about in lots of different books um, about being able to separate those thoughts and be very clear on, on your direction. Well, I, I, I think I've been lucky in that over the years I've had a number of very good people that have had an influence on me. Uh, they've almost been mentors and somehow they've shown up at the right time. And mm -hmm. I'll always remember a uh, long, long, long time ago, Zig Ziglar said to me, and, and it's something he's put in his books, but he said, you know, the price of persistence weighs ounces. The price of regret weighs tons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So whenever I've had, I've come to a crossroads and I've thought, do I want to carry on doing this? Shall I go and get a proper job or something similar? I, I've, I've remembered that, you know, would I, would I regret this if I did not really? And I, I think two of the saddest words in the world are if only. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, yeah, and, and, and something else, I was, uh, like you say, a lot of people get to their deathbed and it's, it's always the, the, it's not what you did do that you regret, it's what you didn't do. But um, someone I was reading when you were talking about um, reflection, uh, David Peterson, very much advocates, taking action, but it's action times reflection. Mm equals learning so it's it's not just having that knowledge because we've all got like you say oodles of knowledge that just is crammed in our brain but in that in that moment of reflection you're able to truly know i think probably what people give up on is is this truly for me and just stick to it really i think so that's wonderful that you you've got that as as the strength in, in your toolkit so we, we, we've kind of covered those those areas and you, you rightly said your weaknesses first, which was wonderful and uh, which a lot of people do. And um, the next area that we look at is resources. And with some companies, obviously, they're, they're very heavy on providing services and so that they, they might have a lot of uh, people and teams to concentrate on or some people might be heavily focused on products. And, and yours is a service business with a product outcome, which is the coaching qualification. So what do you find arms you with your company in mind in, in that, that getting that fine balance between end result of a, a qualification of a diploma in a coaching in the coaching world? And and I think it's tough in the coaching world now. We really are questioned as coaches. So where do you look for your resources here, Gerald, to provide that? amazingly excellent end result of being able to say, I am a qualified coach that can deal with people's lives. Okay, so th there's a few questions within that question, I guess. Yeah. And many of the people listening to this, I am, I am imagining might be solopreneurs, self-employed people starting out 
and worried about the fact that they have very limited resources, very limited money, very limited assets, capital, and so on, and, and, and wondering how in goodness name can I make this work? Yeah. And what I've learned a long time ago, and, and even more so now, is that first of all, you probably need a lot less than you think you need to get things going because we can get misled by all of the marketing and advertising by slick organizations out there saying you need me you need my product my service my company you probably don't to be truthful mm. but the biggest best resource that you will need and will have to use are other people mm. and you would be amazed at how helpful and generous other people can be and one of the big mistakes that individuals usually make in the beginning is they don't ask for help um, and if you get over that it, and, and you grit your teeth and you ask people for help for support you will be astounded by what help people will give you um, and, and, and it's, it's gratifying, it, it's incredible, it's humbling. So yeah. the first thing people need to realize is, in terms of resources, you are never going to make it, whatever making it means to you, you are never going to make it as a hermit. You need the help and support of other people. Now, when you've made it, you can go and live in a cave then and be a hermit if you want. But, <laughs> uh, but, but you will never make it on your own you absolutely, positively must have the help and support of other people. Now, that does not mean you have to pay them and you have to have salaries. So many people will be willing to support you in the early days because of the joy and satisfaction it gives them in supporting you. Then, as you start to grow your business, it's so important to look around. I remember in the early days, I went to one IT company who charged me 500 pounds, which I did not have, I could barely afford, uh, to do a logo and one of the first website um, um, configurations and looks for me. They created the look of the website and the logo. Today, you can get logos done on the internet on companies like Fiverr or Freelancer for five or ten dollars. So, there are so many resources now if people only search that do not require a huge amount of um, money or investment um yeah also on the internet there are now so many it platforms and products that will help you to market your brand that actually cost pretty much nothing Whereas in the old days, we used to have to do physical mail shots using the post office and mail. It cost a fortune. Now, with a bit of effort on your part, you can build up mailing lists and write a press release and get the word out for pretty much nothing. So we're blessed in many ways. We're absolutely blessed in the fact that today we are surrounded by resources if we only take the time to look. So what do you think was the um, element that helped you get to that point? Was it your um, tenacity, your curiosity? What was it inside you that thought, well, hang on a minute, I'm not going to pay £500 for a logo? Oh, no, no, it was, it was a much different emotion. It was, we call it desperation. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, yeah, you were desperate and then you just knew you had to go out and keep trying and keep trying. Yeah, and, and I knew that I couldn't afford that anymore and I needed more of that, but I yeah. couldn't afford that. So yeah. I just thought, well, there must be a, a different way. You see, yeah. sometimes these negative emotions can be very positive. You know, another great emotion is disgust. Mm. Disgust at where you are. When you look in the mirror and you say, this is not who I am. This is not where I want to be in life. This is not where 10 years ago I pictured I would be. And mm. I am not happy with where I am. Yeah, yeah. And we, in business, we have a phrase in Noble Manhattan, in our leadership meetings, we, we have a constant phrase we use where we say, 
we must confront the brutal facts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people, all people, everyone, we sabotage ourselves by deliberately ignoring the brutal facts. Yeah. Um, and we like to point the fingers of blame outwards. We very rarely stand in front of the mirror and point them inwards. And this is very important that we do that and that we stand in front of the mirror and we say, you know, wh wh whatever is happening in my life, wherever I am, whatever I am experiencing, you know, the truth is I am responsible. Mm -hmm. And if I want to change, then it's up to me, not the world. There is no point in blaming the world. There's no point in blaming the government, the weather, the tax, uh, whatever. There's no point at all. Um, if it's to be, it's up to me. And the real change starts to happen when you and I accept total responsibility for where we are mm. and when we accept responsibility for getting ourselves to where we want to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I think sometimes we have, you and I, we read a lot, we, you know, we've got that awareness and sometimes people don't have that awareness. And the big thing that occurs to me when you're saying what you say, which totally I can and see, and I've gone through that journey myself, um, is that people have a, 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 well, people, myself included, you have a set way of thinking that the world is and that you need to fit into that category and that there's somewhere you've got to be already and that if it doesn't happen, then you've got to go back in your box because, oh, it's too risky out there and I tried it a little bit, but I haven't become like Richard Branson and that, that happens in five days anyway, so why hasn't it happened already? So all I'm saying is um, it can be scary to people like myself and, and other people I've met who've tried and become successful in certain businesses. Um, and the book I'm reading is called the, um, the, the Code of the Extraordinary Mind. It's very much saying just break all of your beliefs and your habits, which is what we do as coaches with, with, mm -hmm. with our clients. Um, but it's such a strong culture that we have out there of, well, if you've tried and it hasn't happened within a couple of weeks, then you've got to go back. You can't keep failing. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really intense, uh, I think, Gerald. Uh, and I'm not making excuses, like you say. It looks tough out there. And, and, and like you, it becomes desperate and like we've all you know, been through those emotions. And um, as I say, I'm not making excuses for it, but I'm just saying this is why many people are stuck in jobs and situations where they don't think they can break out of what's possible, you know, they don't think everything that they want for their life is possible. So um, that's the job of us. <laughs> and it's translating what occurred for you and what occurred for me, which is why I'm making videos like this. Is there that you are doing currently that can help channel all of what we've just discussed in the last five minutes? It's, I mean, obviously, providing the coaching qualifications itself um, is a way of providing people in the world who can then go and talk about possibility in people's lives and set goals. What else is it, is it that you think that we can do? Is it just to just keep broadcasting things like this and writing books and coaching people? Well, the, the very sad fact is that people, human beings, are the most creative people or things you'll ever meet in your life. Human beings have got such incredible abilities, but the sad fact is the majority of people only use, and I don't know what the percentage is, but it, it's a very low percentage of what they are truly, truly capable of being, seeing, having, doing, achieving, and leaving. Um, and we do not live up to our potential. And I say we, the royal we, the majority of us. And therefore, one of the greatest things, the greatest things that coaches can do for their clients is to open their clients' eyes and help the clients to start believing in themselves. 
there's an old saying, I, I don't even remember who said it first, but, you know, believing in incredible you. And, and that's one of the great things coaches can and should be doing, helping their clients to believe in their own incredibleness. Is that a word? Is that correct grammar? I don't know. Incredibleness. Um, so, it, it, you know, and, and helping them to understand that actually they can pretty much achieve almost anything they want. Because most people fall into the trap of being conditioned by the world we live in, by society, by the education system, and, and being conditioned to accept far, far less than they truly are capable of doing and being. Mm, yeah. And do you find a lot of people, because I think when you become aware, you gain this new awareness of, oh, responsibility is 100% with me and it's down to me and actually it's not about Lloyd's just shut a load of, the, you know, just um, yep. thousands of jobs have just been lost and, oh, it's because of the EU and, oh, it's because mm. of government. Um, like you say, there's all that conditioning, but when we realize it is just down to us, it kind of provides a, a, a catch-22. You're between a rock and a hard place because then you have this awareness, then you now know you need to just con constantly, daily be putting into practice. Yeah. You see some people stuck like that, that they have this new coaching awareness, but <laughs> they can't because we're human and we prefer to just do the easy habits rather than the tough habits like go to the gym and train. Do you see a lot of people get stuck and then not want to then continually take? Because every day you just got to, if there's no easy pill that you take, like, you know, and we've still got to continue to take the actions. Richard Branson and uh, Alan Sugar and, um, you know, uh, everyone's got to continue to take the actions to be successful. So do you see a lot of people getting still stuck like that in their sort of semi-success awareness? Yeah, of course they do. In fact, nine, I don't know the percentage, but it's huge. You know, 99% of people are stuck in their own quite limiting reality. Even entrepreneurs, even a huge amount of entrepreneurs who are creating things in the world are still stuck within their own particular comfort zones. And they don't see what they could be doing. And it's especially true for the millions of employed people, many of whom, as you mentioned just now, Lloyds are closing some branches. They're going to make 3,000 people redundant shortly. And that's incredibly sad for those people. And if they're not careful, many of those people will get conditioned by the people around them, by their community, by the society, into believing that there is no other work for them, there's nothing else they can do, and that their productive life, in, in, for the older people maybe, has come to an end. And that is so not true. So, yeah. one of the challenges, one of the things we have to realize is that one of the greatest benefits you have are the people around you. However, one of the greatest liabilities you have could also possibly be the people around you. And there are people, and I don't mean this in a horrible way, but I'm going to use a word to emphasize it. There are toxic people. Mm. Who, now, I don't mean that nastily, but I mean that they will affect your thinking. They will cloud your thinking and stop you believing in yourself the way you need to believe in yourself. Mm. And therefore, it's crucial that everyone mixes with motivating people. people and it, it's important to mix with people that you aspire to be like mm. and i remember reading many many years ago my my first mentor a man called bob patmore told me and i think he got it from jim Rohn. he said five years from now gerard he said five years from now you're like exactly as it is now except for the following things the books you read the courses you take and the people you mix with yeah. and that has always stuck with me and he was right and to anyone listening to this that is the truth five years from now their life will be exactly the same as it is today except for the books they read the courses they take 
and the people that they mix with. And then the actions they consistently choose to take. Mm. But they, if you mix with the right people, you get motivated to take those actions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I can't help but think a lot of what you're saying is, is based on, on, on the fear of, and, and you say about toxic people. A lot of that is just fear anyway. That the, it's, it's squashing the poppy syndrome, isn't it? So yeah. if someone's got some potential or is very positive, let's squash that so that I don't have to try harder as well. So it's the state of being human. But um, yeah, thank you. Uh, for sharing all of that, Gerald, and moving on from resources and the people around you, and, and that's really great that you did share that, because I am finding that now, that it's getting out there and talking to people and doing things that I wouldn't usually do and putting myself in the uncomfortable discomfort zone. Um, and uh, I set up a Facebook business page yesterday, and I'm astounded that there's nearly 100 people who've liked the page now and have already started to um, give me star ratings and you really have got to put yourself there out with people and the big thing with me is the confidence thing even now even being a, a great coach um, that has always uh, stopped me from doing those things so I, I totally agree with what you're saying talk to people um, but the last final part we're looking at is, is insights um, for you what have been some of your your best insights and, and, and learning really um, and where do you get your insights and learning from is it sitting in the cafe uh, in Weymouth every day or when you can now because you're so busy yes, right? yes, no. yes and no yes I know um, I, I think two two insights that just come to me intuitively are trying and learning First of all, I've realized over the years that you, how, how will you know if you can do anything? How will you know if the idea you have it is good, is worthwhile, will succeed? You've got to try. And you've got to keep on trying. And if it fails, does that mean it's a failure? No, of course not. It just means that you didn't try in the right way. So one of the, the, the insights I've had is you've got to try and you've got to try with a significant amount of effort and energy. You know, having a 50% go at it isn't enough. Um, so if you really want something, you've got to go for it. Um, so that's one thing. You've got to keep trying. And the second thing is learning. Learning is not a 10-year thing we do when we're teenagers and at, at school. Learning is a lifelong activity. And... One insight I have had many years and have today is that learning is one of the most enjoyable activities you can engage in. It is something that is so motivating. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't believe, and it's just my thoughts here, I don't believe that enough people engage or put in enough time learning. And we should be constantly learning all the time. I mean, imagine... Imagine if someone incredible, you mentioned Richard Branson, there are so many people like him. Imagine someone does something or goes through an incredible experience for five years and they write a book and you can read that book in five days and take that knowledge. Isn't that incredible? We can learn from OPEs, we call it other people's experiences. And we can learn so much from other people. And the libraries of this world are filled with the knowledge of all the greatest men and women for the last 2,000 years, right up to the present. And yet, something like less than 10% of people have a library ticket. Um, you can now access all the greatest minds in the world on Amazon, on Kindle, for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Um, and yet... Most people read, the ones that do read, read trivia, absolute trivia. Mm -hmm. And nothing wrong with trivia, but you should also learn some enhancing material. So one of the greatest insights I have had is to constantly learn. And I love it. Mm -hmm. I spend time every week learning. I, I, I don't succeed, but I try and read a book a week. Um, mm -hmm. I don't always succeed, but, but I try and do that. Um, 
and I find it so motivating. Mm -hmm. um, something I do is uh, every day if I'm walking the dog, I'll listen to a TED talk. Um, yeah. TED is, I just, um, and again, I think the thing with all of this, Gerald, is you've got to find what works for you. Mm -hmm. You kind of take the element of what you're being told, which is, like you say, constantly learn, constantly take responsibility, constantly reflect, you know, take these things, but then find the method that works for you. Because I think something people fall down on is go, oh, if, if Gerard's reading a book, I'll read, but I actually find reading hard. So I do audible. Um, yeah. So I listen, my headphones, and I, I really consume that really, really well. And it, I think it's experiencing it as well as I take it on, but then apply it to my life because it's too much consuming going on in the world. And it's, it's, it's actually understanding how it applies to you in your life. Yeah. So that's another really important element, I think, is, is we're, not, we're not consumers anymore. It's, the world is about experience with the internet mm -hmm. and, and with the way that we are evolving as a species. We're, we're, we are now experiencing and, and reacting and, and interacting with each other a lot differently now. So mm -hmm. it, it, it is fascinating. But that, that's something that I do is um, daily try to feed my mind yeah. uh, or else you'll be fed something else. You don't choose to feed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what about, so that's your, that's kind of some of your insights. Um, what would you and, and you suggest people learning? So looking future-wise more, what what would you say that is some of the important component parts that we've discussed that, or, or something that we haven't discussed that you're taking into the future? Where 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 do you see the future going? So I always say keep a very strong check of reality, but also keep the real hope and the future there in your mind as well and it's keeping the balance between where are you going and you know your goal and reality well i think that right now you and i are so lucky i believe you and i live in the most exciting time that there ever has been in human history and there's good and bad about that the, the good news is change is happening at a more rapid pace than ever before the bad news is change is happening at a more rapid pace than ever before. And yeah. Yeah. Change, change is going to bring with it problems and progress. Mm. I, I, I study what's happening in the world a lot. There are going to be industries that in the next 10 years will dramatically change. The banking industry, the insurance industry, they will not need 50% of the people they have today. Mm. Mm. And the automotive industry will change. Driverless cars are coming. It doesn't matter if you like these things, if you don't like them. It doesn't matter if you agree or you don't agree. We call these things a truism. It's true whether you like it or not. So they're coming. And um, the haulage industry will not need drivers. Uber has put in an order, an order for 100,000 driverless cars to be delivered in five years' time. Uber will become huge but they're going to get rid of their drivers. All of this change. Education is changing faster than we can keep up with it. So we live in a world now which is changing so rapidly, it is almost difficult to keep up with it. Augmented reality will be pretty much mainstream in three to five years. Virtual reality in six to seven years. That's going to change everything. So in my industry, I realized that we are going to have to deliver our training courses and interact with our students and coaches in a completely different way. We're going to have to use uh, platforms that don't even exist today, but will be mainstream in five years. Um, I find that exciting and I find it, I get a bit anxious about it at times. Will I be able to keep up? Will we be able to keep ahead of the trend? But at the same time, there will be tens of millions of new jobs created in industries that don't actually even exist properly yet today. Mm -hmm. um, so we live in such an exciting time. Um, and my insight is that you and I and everyone else must 
constantly be aware of the change happening around us yeah. and we must take steps to take advantage of that change and let it be a positive influence in our lives and our families' lives rather than let it be a negative influence. And so what would be some of the steps that you're starting to prepare yourself? Could you say like a lot of that technology is not there? So we well, we're already, I've already got teams now investigating whole new what we call LMS, learning management systems, online learning platforms, ways of delivering our courses using uh, similar tools to this Google Hangout, uh, using advanced webinars, um, programs that will allow us to reach out and touch people in a much more meaningful way, but without them having to necessarily leave their homes, which would reduce the cost for future students massively, which would be great. Um, so we're looking at all of these. Yeah. All of these things. Yeah, and that's it. And I think some of the most important things you can do is kind of set that thought out there, but then start to take some actions consistent with it. Because this is something I've done now is, is I'm setting out some new webinars that I'm calling Finding Your Superhero. And I was pushed to do that by actually listening to a couple of um, bloggers and, and people who are already doing it, saying sometimes you have to create the, the, the action before you even know actually what you're going to do because then it will all start to catch up and fall into place. And, that, and I found that that's what's happened is I don't know precisely what the webinar is going to contain. I just know it's going to, it's going to be an element of coaching, talking about attitudes, beliefs, breaking down habits and reforming new um, successful habits to achieve individual goals, whatever they might be. Mm -hmm. um, but I've actually found the more I've started to speak to people, like I said, Facebook and looking at social media and putting the thoughts out there, people have started to interact with me and ask me questions that which has clarified in my mind what it is and what it isn't. But yeah. I think you're probably right. You have literally got to start to putting some thoughts out there in the world and then it will, it will we are so afraid as human beings that we have to, well, certainly me, that things have to be packaged and I have to know what it is. And you won't know what it is till you, you till you've sampled it and like you say, try, try, try. And then you'll have something to deliver. I think, it, it, again, as Richard Branson said, if I ended up with the product that I first started with, I'd be ashamed of it. Yeah. Because it's not, what, you know, worlds away from... So I think that's the best thing to say, Gerard, is, mm -hmm. is get out there and start putting thoughts out there and you're putting teams out there investigating it. Put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. It's mainly, I think, what you're saying. Yes. So, it, you know, there, there's an old adage... Um, if in doubt, do nothing. And, and I, I prescribe to the opposite. If in doubt, do something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and a good way to, to end, and I think we're, we're coming up to the hour now. So um, if you, uh, I don't know. Oh, actually, one thing I wanted to mention, which I asked you at the beginning before we started recording, is um, Finding Your Superhero, which is my new webinar, and I'm putting out a, a hashtag on Twitter um, all about um, what have you done today to make to make yourself feel proud. Uh, and, you know, superheroes just go out and they, you know, save people and put themselves, you know, they go beyond themselves and they use their natural talent, whatever it is, whether it be holding a door open for an old lady, whether somebody drops something, a child falls over, whatever. And I just wanted to say to you, what, are you, um, is this something you're finding, Gerard, that is out there that now that people are becoming more aware of their natural talents, their authenticity, that they're, they're being, because I think you, you find what you look for. And if you're looking for bad, you'll probably see bad. So from your point of view and finding your superhero, is, is that something that applies to you and your general concept of, interacting with people and, and can you name a time that um when you found yourself being a superhero <laughs> right that, that that is such an unfair question <laughs> um, We're that, is so, that is such, such a horrible question um um okay you're you're right people tend to lay over the world their reality their own coloring mm. their own transparency so they view the world through their own conditioning yeah and what I learned many, many years ago when I left the Marines and I got started into uh, 
the business life. Again, it was uh, one of my mentors taught me right at the beginning. I was so lucky to, to be influenced by this man. Um, and he said, Gerard, you can get anything you want out of life as long as you help enough other people get what they want first. Now, many people have heard that expression, but they forget the last word. The last word is first. So you can get anything you want as long as you help enough other people first. So it, it's all to do with the law of the universe. The law of the universe, and you've heard this in many ways, no matter what your upbringing or where you live, but in, in some cultures, they call it the law of sowing and reaping. You have to sow before you can reap. Emerson, in his uh, essay, called it the law of compensation. In science, in physics, we call it the law of cause and effect. But it simply means that you have to give before you receive. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people in the business world, unfortunately, live by the opposite. They say, first of all, you give to me, whatever it is, money or something, and then I give you the service and product. Mm -hmm. The law of the universe is the opposite. Real success comes to those who give first and and receive later. Um, and and, when, and you, you coach this, obviously, because I've, I mean, I've, I've seen uh, you discuss some of your values last year and, and very much adhere to a lot of what you teach, Gerald. When you do coach this, how, how well has that gone and how well have people taken that well, on board? As an, it, like you say, it's almost like a law of the universe. It uh, is. You, and what, what, what usually happens is when you go over this with people, they nod wisely, they look at you and they say, oh, yes, of course. But then the majority go back and don't do it in their normal life, um, even though intuitively they know it makes sense. Intuitively, they know it is the truth. Yeah. But they go back and just fall into the old, what I would call, patterns. Yeah. Your life will truly change when you are able to take that concept on as a new pattern, as a new uh, blueprint for living, that you give without expectation of receiving. However, you will receive. It always happens. It cannot not. Yeah, and I know this is something that you do yourself because you, you talked about it last year at the residential. That uh, That's a, a big part of you, you actually give a lot of things away and, and, yeah. and donate a lot of things. Um, what do you think would be a good tip for someone who, who forgets that every just day? To, just but, to practice it in little bits, just little practice. You know, when you pass a, a per person on the street who's begging, just give them something, whatever, even if it's a tiny thing, whatever you can, just without any expectation of getting something back, just start to give and start to do little kindness, little acts of kindness. Little acts, doesn't have to be mind-bogglingly huge. Help someone, open the door, pull out the chair for someone, help someone out of the car. Just be nice, you know? Just be yeah. nice, and the world will be nice to you back. Very true. Uh, and, and like you say, practice it, because there's a lot of habits, that I've, new habits that I've formed, that um, you like you say, pick up upon that tip and then just keep doing it every day. And then you, it will, if you consistently apply that, it will start to become a habit. You'll start to see the results from it. And then it, all, it obviously becomes a, a yeah. cycle that you'll just continue to do it because you'll see that actually it, it is benefiting you, other people, well, other people firstly, but then it, it, can, it does benefit yourself as well. And it's this attitude of gratitude that a lot of people talk about, isn't it? And yeah. Which, again, people used to think was very American. And then you link it to America and go, oh, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. But actually, it's not. It's a law of, it's a law of the universe. And sure. uh, people need Surely. to know. Yeah. But thank you, Jared. That was wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing uh, all of your insights. And, and that has been, and it's reminded me of a few things as well, which was really good. Um, so uh, yeah, I will post this now, and then hopefully people can start to follow it, and then ask questions after the broadcast. Right. Thank you very much, Jared. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you ever so much. You take care.
Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.